This has been an interesting project for us. Uh, Greg and Dom contacted us uh, because of the work we're doing on populations, and um, I love telling people I'm working with Leeds University Department of History and Philosophy. They just look at me blankly. So um, it has been quite challenging, but also giving us some good information and good ways of thinking, not just within our population work, but the other work we're doing as well. So I'm going to talk today to you about um, really where we are. We, we started uh, over a decade ago um, working, uh, looking at diversity. I want to give you a bit more about the background on it. Um, our journey so far, um, where we are and where we think the future might be. We're, we're not at the end, we're probably at the beginning of one of the ends, but we're, we've still got a fair bit to go on this. So, our drivers, these are really our incentives. So, we're an organic research institute, uh, we work in organic and low input systems, and we're probably the same as any other um, agricultural research institute in the world. Our drivers are about feeding ourselves for now and in the future. Um, climate change, extremes of weather conditions, how we deal with that. Energy use, um, how do we be more effective with our energy use? How do we reduce our energy use in producing our food? Um, and then particularly looking at the loss of agricultural and um, also biodiversity. Um, and then the other aspect which is very clear with us working within a, uh, an organic and um, an agroecological concept is actually about the socioeconomic. Um, who controls the farmer systems? Um, and so we came at this looking at a number of different ways. We were looking at diversity. But where we are now is in, in the, the broader context within the UK is about an industrialised system um, where basically one size fits all and it's about a monoculture. There's nothing inherently wrong, actually there could be inherently wrong with a monoculture. There are many reasons why we have monoculture. There was a great need to feed ourselves, there was a, uh, a want for people not to work on the land anymore, and so people, we needed to find ways of actually how do we simplify, how do we improve our efficiencies, how do we improve our output. And so for the farmer, there's an ease of planting, harvesting, marketing, um, we've got bigger tractors, we've got bigger fields, um, we've got plants that actually responded better to input. And so there was, a, there was a great way there where the farmer then got a familiarity um, with the needs of each variety. That could be supplied either by earlier days by government um, agronomists or by seed companies or input companies. And for the larger corporation, um, it was fine. They could breed new varieties. They could have a... They, they could, um, develop new ones that could supersede, take over mothers, produce better disease resistance, pest resistance, respond to nitrogen, yields. Um, they could produce the inputs then that would feed into those and help them. They could then produce more machinery um, and then this industrial size, industrial scale of processing and marketing of the produce at the end of that. And um, we then had much more food, we were much better um, fed uh, we weren't always more healthy, as um, we're now finding, but there were really good reasons why we went down this route. However, there were problems with that. Where there were lock-ins once we got into this biodiversity system, this system, where there was a huge loss of diversity, whether that was agricultural or biodiversity. And also we got to a point where, because we could control so many things, that there was a selection for disease of pests and weeds. We didn't really, we could control those through other ways rather than through our plant systems. There was a massive increase in fossil fuel use. We had cheap energy until recently, probably still do. And there were pollution and negative impacts on the ecosystem, whether that was loss in biodiversity, air quality, loss of soil, water, all these sort of aspects. So, we stood back, and this, a lot of this is built on work from Martin Wolf, who is actually on site today but not here. Um, we were really looking at, and actually within organic systems and low input systems, is about diversity. And there are a number of work, a number of papers being published on this, but actually what we've seen from Leroux in 2010 is that actually as you increase the diversity of a system, you generally increase the stability, and also you can increase the productivity. However, that productivity may be more complicated and more difficult to get out, which again is going back to why monoculture was so effective, is because you could do one thing in one place and it is simple. We knew that works in the um, ecological context and actually the concepts, but how do you put a diversity into a farming system? So, 
there's a number of ways you can do that, but basically we'd need to do it simultaneously. You're done through rotations, so that's rotations of crops and livestock. You can have species mixtures, whether that's crop species mixtures or with, li- with hens and cows and others. And you can do intercropping if you want to get more complicated. But also within a cropping system, you could work on mixtures. So that could be mixtures of varieties or land races or whatever. Or you can produce populations. Our work really was we wanted to look at increasing diversity within the crop. Uh, We did some work initially looking at at varieties, uh, which is a simple way of doing it. When we're looking at the IP and as we move forward on my talk, I'll explain a little more about our our issues. But also um, we started working on composite cross populations. And that was the route we decided to go down and particularly looking at um, using the sort of philosophy or the principle of evolutionary plant breeding. What does these composite cost populations give us? So the positive side is that um, what you do is you mix an awful, you basically cross an awful lot of varieties, all sort of germplasm together. So you get more phenotypic and genotypic variation, bigger diversity there, so you increase the capacity. You actually get, they, they can complement each other. Different genotypes will complement different genotypes within your stand, and you again get a compensation. If one fails, the other can take over, or if one takes over, the other doesn't have to come in. And actually, the, the, the theory is that you do get some change and some evolutionary shift. However, all of those seeds above it can interact with each other and actually compete with each other, and so it's not always a positive interaction. You can get a negative interaction as well. However, just a couple of examples, uh, one from the paper and one anecdotal from our own site, that actually we know, as you, we, we've seen in agricultural systems, that you can, um, you do get benefits from it. So this is from a paper of Martin's in the early 90s, which is looking at the, the Old East Germany. Um, and basically, uh, as the area in the red, which is the area of mixtures that was grown, as that increased from 83 to 90 uh, after the fall of the... Um, the Iron Curtain, and then the, the, the issues there with actually the lack of availability of inputs and these things. As the, uh, the increase in the mixtures went up, the level of uh, mildew infection and then actually fungicides that was needed was reducing. So just on one factor here, there is an example of how actually mixtures and so a, um, a, a more diverse system can perform and can help. This is just a, as I said, an anecdotal one. Um, um, it's quite shocking, actually, when you see it. So this is a, uh, the trial. Actually, Nick at the back probably put this in. Um, this is our trials. This was our Wakeland site, our field site uh, near Dis. And this is our field trials on wheat and our populations in October 2012. So they went in, would have gone in in September, and this is the trials across it, and alchemy is about um, halfway down there. So there's not a lot you can see on this, and this was put in on the 16th of October. We then had, before we could get the next set of trials in, uh, the weather changed. It was a bit wet. So this then went in, what's that, nine days later, and uh, alchemy failed to establish, basically. So um, anecdotal issue here, but actually what we've seen here, the variation and the, um, the, just the, the spread of germplasm you have in your population allows it to compensate and to um, recover, where alchemy, which is a really good variety and performs really well, had really bad conditions for it, and it couldn't perform. So, that was just saying, setting the background why we did it. So what do we do? Um, we want to develop a diversity within varieties of wheat, and we went down the composite cross populations. So, in fact, uh, we started on a project in 2001, 2002 with the John Innes Centre. So, our populations were produced here, and they were crossed, and we had 20 parents, and they were all crossed on a half dial. This means basically we went male to female, we didn't do female to male. So, we produced actually three populations. There was a uh, Y, which is for yield. Uh, there was a Q, which is for quality, which is basically protein. And then we had another one, which we called YQ, which was for yield and quality. So of all that, we then did, uh, we generated about 190 individual F1s. And then we grew those on to sell them into the F2s. Um, these were then pulled, and that's by the time we got them. And um, we bulked them up, and then we started working um, with these very diverse populations. And we tested them both on uh, in trial sites, 
in, on small plot trials, but also as we got more seed, we moved it out into organic and low input conventional farmers as well, spread around uh, England. And then that project finished, we had another project, and then we've managed to put these, po these populations into a, number, a series of projects, which actually the last lot uh, came out last year, and we're still doing things with them now. And so after a decade or so work, we have a pretty good idea about how these specific populations might perform. So, we know we've got better great, greatest yield stability in their parent lines. We didn't always get better yield, but over the period of time, the stability of the yield was much more constant. Um, the protein content and hardness was significantly increased, so actually we know that actually the, the value and the quality was better. The baking quality was good, and we just had some feedback from bakers at the moment who really like it. It was as nutritious. Which sure what happened there, excuse me. It was as nutritious, but we, as this was a research experiment, we were pushing it on different things. So we wanted to see whether it worked for malting uh, for the brewers and for distillers, for whiskey makers. Um, it wasn't very good. Uh, actually, generally both of those, if you have high protein levels, it's not good for those. So we were not surprising. And it was suitable for animal feed. So if you're looking at wheat in the UK, we hit... We could get some bread out of it. Artisanal bakers, basically, didn't really fit very well with the Chorley Wood method and rapid methods, but also it, it was fine for farmers on their feed. Also, working with John's Centre, they did a lot of genetic analysis, and we know that actually we maintained, over these 10, 15 years, we know we maintained the diversity, the genetic diversity. We lost one or two genes, but nothing extreme on it. Um, to actually cause adaptation, we had to go in and do something physically. So that was either sorting by size, grain size, sorting by colour. You can go in and rogue, you can take out high layers, or you can go and choose bits. So you can make it move, but, but in the time frame we worked in, you actually you didn't get this sort of evolutionary shift, but then over a decade or so, that's not too surprising. What we did know, though, as I've seen from some of the, the, the pictures I put up, that it can cope with a range of different environmental conditions. Generally what happened, we, we ha actually went to Hungary at one point, and it went through a Hungarian winter. It looked pretty poor the following spring, but actually that was then harvested, and it then bounced back the following year. So we know that actually it has got a, it, it buffers quite well. Farmers wanted it, and actually the farmers who worked with both conventional and organic liked it. it, it fitted within their systems. That's when we came against the IP issue. It's actually illegal to market seed. It is, uh, it's not a variety, it didn't fit any of the seed regulations. So, we know that there are a series of EU laws that we need to go through, we have to make sure the quality is right, the seed health is right, but also it needed to be distinct, uniform and stable and it needed to be VCU, so it needed to um, be the value for cultivation and use. So sustainable, DUS for a population is an anathema. It doesn't need to, we don't want it to be distinct. It's a population. It doesn't want to be uniform, that's it, and stable. For God's sake, that's not the whole point. It isn't stable because actually you can move around from it. However, and uh, sorry, and also within VCU, uh, the more you look at the regulation there, the... Um, what is um, value? And actually, when you look at the regulation, uh, value can be interpreted in a number of different ways, and it was being interpreted in such a way within the UK that was restricting things, where actually value for a, an intensive conventional farmer may be very different than a small organic or a mixed farmer and these things. So there were ways around these. So um, while all this breeding work has been going on, and actually, I must admit, I didn't do any of the breeding. I oversaw most of this. Um, we worked uh, with our own government and with others, uh, Ricardo is one of them, but actually to look at regulations and at policy. And I have to give, must admit, DEFRA, or I think it was MAF at the time, came to us right at the start on this project and wanted to engage. Our seed regulators, uh, which were fairer until very recently, and I can't remember their new name, they've been with us every step of the way, prodding us when we need to. So, what they were working with us was actually to aim to how do we market heterogeneous material, um, and I say that started right from 2001. Um, 
it's gone through a number of different projects. Within, we worked in the UK within, uh, with the John Newsom Centre project and then a link project after that. We then moved into the EU arena where we worked with Ricardo, uh, the French and a number of others. Um, and we're now working on a number of other projects that are right across Europe, um, working with um, a policy end which is looking at how regulations can change, how we can adapt, how we can work with this. And it got to a point where we were in a point where we could... Uh, we had a strong enough case. We had uh, the civil service and the policymakers from a number of nations willing to come with us, and we presented it to Europe. And from the, uh, the 1st of March 2014, it became a reality. There was allowed to have a marketing uh, experiment um, for four. Uh, cereal varieties. So from the 1st of March 2014 to the 3rd of December 18, we have an opportunity to market heterogeneous material in oat, barley, wheat and maize. In the UK, we are doing wheat, we are doing wheat, we are aware of maize in Germany, uh, I'm in communication with the French and uh, in communication with the others and there's a new EU project starting in, in a couple well, started the kickoff meetings a couple of weeks, which Ricardo and Sally at the back will be at, where this will be taken forward a little more. So, we're, we're marketing wheat, and here is my very official form that I'm actually now a, seed, a registered seed producer, even though I'm a deputy director of an institute, and I am really making this up as I go along on a lot of these things. Um, so our population is being bulked up. We've decided we'll do the, the, um, the yield quality. It performed as well, and in fact, at the time, it was the most... We, we, had, we had more seed of that. It was easy to go with. Uh, the UK Seed Authority has been brilliant with us. Um, we're making sure we get the paperwork in place. We have to ensure that we're, our crops registered. Uh, they've been out and notified. We, well, they, they've took samples. I've registered the crop the last few weeks. They've been out and done inspections. And they're, they're, they're nudging us and helping us all the way. Um, one of the things that we need to do is actually find a suitable name. I cannot believe how difficult it is. I have no children. I've named one cat in my life. Naming a wheat variety, and it's got to be called something population. I did a survey. I get votes from people, and we had top three, and my boss doesn't like either of them. Well, all three of them. So I'm in the process at the moment. It's still called YQ1 population at the moment. It may go out as that. I don't know. To fulfil the experiment, we have to do a number of um, other aspects around it, we'll market it, but also you have to, um, it's, a, it's a VCU testing really to make sure it's performing well, how, and we have to, uh, but we have helped write the protocols about how this is done and how it's assessed. But, we're now in a position where we've got it, we've won if you like, um, but we're now moving between the intellectual property on this. So, is it an IP now or is it an IP broad issue? Um, I think our drivers or our, um, why we did it is pretty IP broad and we like to be scientists and we, I work for a charitable organisation. We're not there to um, make vast amounts of money. We're in the seed, in, it's in the seed industry, you're not going to make lots of money. But we are in a position here where um, we want to market this, we want to get it out there, we want to improve things. So the whole point of the population is that they adapt and evolve under local conditions. Um, and then the farmer who we've sold this to should save the seed to adapt to their own farm. OK, they've got to make sure there is hygiene reasons and the quality is all kept there, but that, that can be done. But how do we then monitorise this? We can we become the owner of this population. It's, the documentation is there so we can define who it is, what it, what it is. But actually, once we've sold it once, our objective would be they keep renewing it and keep, keep turning it over on their own farm. So um, how do we cover our costs? How do we work with people to make the better? varieties or vetted populations that may come forward. And I think from what we've found from all this work is that actually there can be better populations. There may be specific things that may be in very high disease areas where they want some more uh, the germplasm that's put in with higher disease. It might be they want better yield or wider quality. How do we do it? So, as I said, we share IP forward values. We're not against IP narrow, but actually our drivers were about improving the world. Um, but we need to cover our costs what would our models be? Um, we have one hit for selling, we can't sell it at fast prices, farmers don't have that sort of money to buy seed, and it's not that good. Why would they save four or five times on a population that isn't going to save it for them? Um, we could try crowdsourcing. I've actually got something in at the moment about whether we should try crowdsourcing on this. Um, perhaps we should have a sort of membership or a closed group. Could we come together with people, design, 
build a population, and then it stays within that group. Um, that actually then takes it out of the seed regulations. We can deal with that. It's not a problem. I'm sure there'll be public funding. Um, we're in an age of austerity. Uh, we've seen research funding drop, PBI closed generations ago. That, we don't know. Could there be a, a levy? Could we... Uh, is it voluntary levy? Is it compulsory? All these sort of things. I have no idea how we deal with this. So we're in a position here where we have... I think it is a, it's a useful tool. It's not the build and end all. But actually, uh, we have a seed system that's being tested in the experimental marketing, where it is heading to IP narrow, uh, because we can define, we can say, and we own this. Uh, a lot of what the aim of it is more in the broad context, but it comes down to filthy lucre. This is Martin Wolf. Martin is the several, well, 17 times great grandfather of these populations. And this was a population grown last year. I should just mention that the bulk of our funding has come from uh, MAF and then DEFRA, uh, the EU Commission, and through the LINK programme. Thank you.